Sisters, this is Dr. William Sneblin coming to you from With One Accord Ministries with another Treasure Garden Guardian teaching. Uh, this one is on the subject of talking about the head covering, the uh, kippa, which we're going to unpack here because a lot of people have all asked over the years. I've been basically wearing uh, a head covering, a kippa, since 2001. And a lot of people over the years have asked, well, why are you doing that? Isn't that a Jewish thing or isn't it part of Babylonian sun worship? And I get that a lot, you know. Uh, people will show a picture of it and they'll say, see, it looks like you're wearing a little sun disc on your head. Well, that that's kind of, frankly, historically unsubstantiated. No, what we're going to look at today is the scriptures and what the Torah and the, both both testaments actually say about this practice, because I think it's a very important and valuable one within the body of Messiah. So, to begin with, I'd like to read one of my favorite passages out of the Psalms, and that is the 91st Psalm, verse 1. It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of El Elyon shall abide under the shadow of El Shaddai. Thank you, Father. We pray you would bless this brief message and we just commit it to you. We pray that I would decrease and that you would increase and that your name would be glorified and that your people would be blessed. In Yahushua's name, Amen. Okay, here's the deal. We are not talking about necessarily anything that is from Rome or from Babylon or anything else. We're talking about something that is from the scriptures. And as I said, I've basically been doing this since 2001. And people can attest to that because you can go back and look at some of the videos that I have done, video teachings that are all over the um, YouTube uh, that are like 15, 14 years old. And you will see that even back then I was wearing uh, what, what the world calls uh, a beanie or a skull cap, uh, the Yiddish word for it is yarmulke, but it is actually called in Hebrew a kippah, and we're going to explore why that is. The word is rooted in the Hebrew word kapar. Okay, this means atonement. It means literally the atoning covering of our master. And um, there's a variation of the word, and I would direct you to uh, Exodus 29.33 and 30.10, among many other places, to uh, substantiate this fact. Now, a variation of the word, which is kippurim, is used in Leviticus 23.27 to talk about the Day of Atonement, which is in Hebrew is called, it's actually Day of Atonements, plural, and it's called Yom HaKippurim. So there again, we have the idea that this is an atoning covering. Even more critically, the word is related to another Hebrew word, kaporet. And this is the word that is used to describe what, what the King James Bible calls the mercy seat, the lid, so to speak, that was on the Ark of the Covenant, the Aron Kadosh. So... There again, we have this idea of it being a covering, and, and as many of you may know, the high priest would come in once a year, and he would apply the blood of the sacrificed animals to the lid, the mercy seat, the caporet of the Ark of the Covenant, as the climax of the Day of Atonement. And then this, this blood would go up, you know, to heaven as an offering for all the sins of Israel. So this is a very powerful word. It's a very powerful symbol. Now, so when I take, when I take this and put it on, it's like I am applying to myself the atoning blood of the Lamb of Yahuwah, Yahushua the Messiah. It also reminds me of the helmet of salvation which is, of course, part of the armor, which I hope all of the people that are listening to this are familiar with, okay? 
Then it also refers to the crown and covering that is worn by the Levitical priesthood in the uh, Torah when they went and offered sacrifices. Now, people might say, well, you're not a Levite. And no, I'm not. Uh, but, but I am ethnically Jewish. That's not the point. The point is the Apostle Peter, in his epistle, in 1 Peter 2, 5, says that we are part of a holy priesthood now. <coughs> Excuse me. Thus, all of us, not Sarim, all of us that follow Yehushua as his Talmudim, his disciples, we are part of a holy priesthood of which Yehushua is the high priest. So, this is a wonderful scriptural truth that we need to embrace and that you need to embrace. Also, Exodus 29.9 and 39.28, which is that, that whole region of scripture, is about uh, the Levitical priesthood and, and the vestments and the things that the, um, the Torah set up as being what the, the priest should wear when they go and minister before the altar of Yahuwah. And there's a word there that's used in those two passages to describe the headgear that the priests were wearing. And that word in, in the King James Bible is bonnet. Now I know when we see that word today, we think of, you know, like what Amish women wear or you see old movies set in old fashioned days. That, that's not what it was. Again, the King James translators were speaking out of a different time than ours. Those sort of bonnets were not around in the, you know, in the 1600s. So what it means, actually, it comes from a Hebrew word, which is migba'ah. And this Hebrew word migba'ah, if you go to Strong's and look it up, it references a, a hemispherical cap. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is this. Because if you look at this, which is a similar artifact to what I'm wearing on my head, it looks like a hill. It looks like a little hill. And that's what migba'ah means. And this would have been what the, the Levites, the priests, wore as they ministered at the altar of sacrifice and did their duties in, in the, the sanctuary of both the tabernacle and the wilderness and also in the temple. Okay. So we see that this is, has nothing to do with Babylon. This, this um, ruling, this commandment was brought forth in the Torah before there even was a Babylon. And, you know, it, you can see that what I'm wearing and what you see many, many Jews wear looks a lot like a head, uh, pardon me, a, a hill, a little hill. And that's what the word means, migba'ah. Now, Leviticus 10.6 even says that a, um, a priest should not uncover their head for any reason, even to mourn the dead. Because in those days, and even to this day in some cultures, there was the custom that, um, you know, if you had a loved one die, you would rend your garments, you would take off your head covering, you would sprinkle ashes on. This is the way people used to mourn, you know, 3,000 years ago and maybe even today in certain parts of the world. So even for that, even if a loved one, a beloved parent or whatever died, the Levite or the priest or also the high priest was never supposed to uncover their head. Now, just, just so we're clear about something, elsewhere, in Leviticus, it talks about what the high priest wears, and it's different than this. It's different than the little uh, hat I just showed you. It is what is called a mitre. And it's it, just don't think about the Roman Catholic Church when I say that word. It's nothing like that. It's a more ornate kind of turban-like thing, and it has a gold plate in the front that says Kadosh Yahuwah, which means holiness unto Yahuwah. So... That's what the high priest wore. But we're just talking about, we know our high priest is up in Hashamim, up in heaven. And we don't need an earthly high priest anymore. Hebrews, the epistle of the Hebrews makes that very clear. What we have up down here among the body is we are priests of the order of Melchizedek. And he is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And that's a whole other teaching, which hopefully we'll get to soon. 
But for now, just understand that it is important, according to the scriptures, for people that are followers of Yahushua to cover their heads. Okay, now, first of all, this was not invented by rabbis later on. I mean, some people will try and tell you that oh, this is just like a rabbinical thing. As you can see, there is no evidence for that. What did happen, though, is that after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, and especially after all the Yahudim, all the Jews were thrown out of, of the Holy Land in the middle, in the beginning of the second century AD, then they started to come up with customs to help them keep more or less close to the Torah. Now, some of these things were not very good, and that's a different talk as well. But what I would say is this was part of their way of helping themselves to be distinctive. They would wear this head covering on their head to help them remind them that I am a servant of Yahuwah, even if I'm not, you know, a priest anymore. Okay, now, even though the Torah says that the priesthood and the high priest are who is supposed to wear these things, again, Peter tells us that we are all now priests. So because of that, we can come boldly before the throne of grace Hebrews 4.16. This no longer applies just to the high priest because we know our high priest is ministering powerfully before us in the heavenly sanctuary even as we speak. And so we can go there boldly and seek our Father's favor as long as boldness is never mistaken for uh, disrespect. Okay, again, the idea that the the, we got this from the Pope and the because you do see the Pope wearing a white one, you see cardinals wearing a scarlet thing like this, and you see bishops wearing a purple silk thing like this. These are called zucchettas, and they have nothing to do with this. They stole it from us. We didn't steal it from them because we had it first. Okay, just like a lot of stuff in the Roman Church was stolen from us. And they did that because they wanted to appear to be holy. Well, you know, you can dress up a pig and put lipstick on it. It doesn't make the pig into something wonderful. And it's the same thing with the Roman church. So don't get me started on that. Anyway, here's the interesting thing. If you actually study this stuff out, you will find that um, pagan rituals back then, the ancient Roman rituals, this is, and there's a citation to all these things that's on our website where I have an article related to this topic. And there was the, the false Elohim, uh, Saturn. And the people would always have to approach him with their heads uncovered. Okay, that's paganism. That's the pagan, and you see to this very day, Many, many people, at least within, you know, the high church type churches like the Anglicans and the Catholics and the Orthodox and so on, they uncover their heads when they walk in the door of the church. These people are trying to be reverent, and I, I understand that, but they're basically copying ancient pagan rites. In addition, let me just share this. I don't know if any of you have heard of this man, but Alfred Eidersheim was an early Messianic Christian scholar. In other words, he was a Jew who became a believer just like me. And he wrote this about that time. He said, in regard to the covering of the head, it was deemed a mark of disrespect to walk abroad or to pass a person with a bared head. Slaves covered their heads in the presence of their masters. The ordinary covering of the head was called the sudar, a kerchief twisted into a turban. A kind of light hat was often used, either of a light material or of felt. The sudar was twisted by the rabbis in a particular manner to distinguish them from the others. Of course, they wanted that. We read besides of a sort of cap attached to some parts of inner or outer garments of the outward appearance of Yahushua. His headgear would probably be the sudar wound in a kind of turban or perhaps the maaforet, which seemed to have served as a covering for the back of the head and to descend it down the back of the head and shoulders. So we see that it would be customary, even though when you see pictures of uh, Yahushua, whether paintings or on you know movies and stuff, you almost never see him wearing a head covering. 
He probably did most of the time. Now, do I think all believers should be wearing this kind of a hat? Well, that's between you and the Ruach HaKodesh, the set-apart spirit. But remember, we are all priests ministering before the Most High. And he is everywhere. I mean, there's no place that Yahuwah is not. We are told in the Bible that priests should have their heads covered when they do this. Some may object because of what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, 3, and 4. And they say, oh, this means men shouldn't cover their heads. And he writes, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Messiah, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Messiah is Elohim. Every man praying or prophesied, having his head uncovered, his head covered, I'm sorry, dishonoreth his head. You got to understand, read the context. Remember, a text without a context is a pretext. What it says here, the context is we're talking about spiritual authority, spiritual headship. What is being said is that a man's spiritual covering is ultimately Messiah. See verse 3. If he has any other spiritual covering than that, he dishonors his head. So the Messiah's head is Yahuwah, the husband's head is Messiah, the wife's head is her husband. What Paul is saying here is that no one else should come between the headship of a husband and Yahushua, not even a pastoral leader. And of course, that's contrary to what you hear in a lot of churches, but that's what it says. Thus, the primary meaning is not about headgear, it's about spiritual headship. The other thing I would point out to you is that the word there that's used for covered is the Greek word kata, which means down from or hanging against. This is talking more about a veil than it is a hat. And let me just explain briefly that, that in those days in Corinth, Corinth was a very pagan, rowdy city. I would compare it today to like San Francisco, where all manner of unrighteousness was going on. They had pagan cults. They had homosexuals. They had cross-dressing. And that's what, you know, Paul was talking about. He was talking about men dressing like women and wearing the, wearing the veil of a woman. He was not talking about this. He was not talking about the prayer shawl of a, of a Jewish believer. That's not what he was referring to. He was referring to a, you know, I mean, even to this day, I mean, women wear very different kind of attire. If they wear a scarf or whatever they do, it's more ornate, it's more colorful, it's more beautiful. And, and men, if they wear something like that, and I don't mean, I'm not talking about Muslims here, but just in general, men tend to wear more subdued colors. There's a difference, and that's intentional. Yahuwah wants it that way. So men aren't supposed to dress like women. Women are not supposed to dress like men. And that's Torah, that's scripture. And that's what's talking about that. So the problem is when people go through this stuff, they think, oh, there's a contradiction here. But no, there isn't. Paul is talking about the practice of cross-dressing, which is very common in pagan Greece and pagan Rome. That's what he is referring to, because the Corinthians, as I said, were a very rowdy, unrighteous city. So, in the light of all this, where does the kippa fit into spiritual warfare? Well, does it have some kind of special power in and of itself? No, of course not. That would be superstitious nonsense. But, it is what it represents. It's a symbol. And you know, I'm sure, that the scriptures are full of symbols. I mean, you look at something like, you know, the Ark of the Covenant, which is a symbol of the atoning, you know, blood sacrifice that ultimately reaches forward to Calvary. You see, you know, the idea of the blood being sprinkled in the sanctuary is a symbol of the atoning blood of Messiah. Uh, we see Yahushua talking about the bread and wine when he did the, the Pesach meal as symbolic of his body and his blood. And, you know, there's many, many examples of this all through the scriptures because we are a symbolic people. We, we deal with these things. We deal with our realities often through visual symbols. In the same way, this is a visual symbol. It reminds us of the helmet of salvation, as I said, and by extension, the rest of the armor that's talked about in the scriptures. When I cover my head, it is a reminder to me of the tangible covering of Yahushua 
that is over me as his servant. That's what it is. Remember, the covering of the head back then was the symbol of a servant. And I'm a servant of the living Elohim. And that's why I wear this. I am under the authority of the Most High Creator of the universe. This is incredibly important because you realize that if you're a ministry leader of any sort, whether you're a pastor or whether you're a teacher like me or whatever it might be, there's always the ego thing in there. You can get an inflated ego because people like you and they send you emails and all this stuff or they come up when you preach and they swarm around you and ask you questions and want you to sign their Bibles and all that. You can get a big ego with that. And so this is a reminder, no, I'm under him. And everything I am, I owe to him. And it, it really, really helps as a reminder of that. And what's funny is when I first was saved and for many, many years, I would have terrible nightmares. This is because of my background in some horrible stuff, Satanism, witchcraft, all that stuff, which you can read about in my book, Lucifer Dethroned. And, and, you know, the mind tries to get rid of terrible experiences through dreams, through nightmares. Well, what happened was when I started covering my head, when I went to sleep at night, in addition to the rest of the day, that all stopped. That all stopped. Now, the other thing is that we have had many people report they were set free from terrible nightmares or night terrors just because we suggested to them, doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, maybe you want to cover your head when you go to bed at night, whatever you do the rest of the time. And almost invariably, I mean, we had a one woman who was, um, she was actually being visited by a fallen angel who was trying to rape her. And she would try, you know, she, she was a believer. She would try using the name of Yahushua. She had prayed over her home. She had remitted the sin of the shedding of innocent blood over the land. And still, this angel was showing up and trying to attack her. Well, she called us and we said, why don't you try wearing a scarf? And she thought it was weird. But, you know, she said, well, I've tried everything else, so I'll try it. So she, she wore a scarf to bed and immediately the attack stopped. Another true story is a brother years ago called about he was OCD. He had an obsessive compulsive disorder. And all this stuff was running through his mind. He'd worry about this. He'd worry about that. And, you know, he had all of these, you know, things like he'd have to set up the silverware just right. He had to count steps. I mean, I'm sure you've read about this kind of problem. Well, anyway, we told him, think of the helmet of salvation as a covering for your mind from all of these intrusive thoughts, a lot of which are coming from the evil one. We told him and we prayed with him to throw out the spirit of fear, number one. But number two, we told him, why don't you just buy one of those watch caps you see people wearing all year round, everywhere you see them, and just wear that all the time. And ask Abba to just let it be a symbol for you of the helmet of salvation. And he did, and he said almost within two or three days, all of this stuff stopped. All of these thoughts stopped. Just because he was he was being obedient to the Father and to the Scriptures. And, you know, this kind of stuff really, really works because it reminds you continually that you're under the authority of Yahushua, but that also means you're under his protection. He is the Sather, the abiding presence that it talks about in um, Psalm 91.1. I read at the beginning. So here's the deal. The other thing that a lot of people find blessings for is to wear a prayer shawl, a tallit, when they, when they pray. And when I put this on, it feels like I'm getting a spiritual hug from my Father in heaven. Because if you read Psalm uh, 104 at the beginning, it says, Bless Yahuwah, O my soul. O Yahuwah, my Elohim, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as a garment and who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain. See, Yahuwah has his glorious garment of light. And when we put this on, it's like we are partaking of that and we are asking him, to, to wrap us in his Talit of light. So every morning when I pray, I ask Abba to cover myself and my family 
in Yahweh's talit of light as well as my own. And it's just a great blessing. And it's powerful. It really is. Because again, symbols are powerful. They resonate with the human mind. Okay. The power also, especially with the kippa, is you're being obedient. And as my beloved wife loves to say, obedience is power. And in fact, I have to say this from especially a woman's perspective, Mary, my wife, has written an excellent article on head coverings uh, and, and what the power you can get, you know, either gender, but mo it's more oriented towards uh, women, that, that really is amazing. You know, I have noticed since I have been doing this now for 15 years or more, that the, just the power that is in this simple act of obedience is extraordinary in terms of the shalom in my mind, in terms of the protection of my thoughts and everything else. And you can partake of that as well. It, you know, and in terms of if you're wondering, well, where do you get something like this if you want to do it? Um, there are all sorts of places on the internet where they, they sell these things. They're not expensive. Just pray over them when you receive them because, of course, they're coming, you know, from from Jewish sources that are not, they, I don't think most of these people would ever be a Nazarene, a believer in Yahushua. But still, it's a beautiful thing. You can also make your own. But, but here's the bottom line. It might seem old-fashioned to cover your head. It might seem, especially, you know, for women, oh, this is like something from a bygone era. Well, that might be. But a lot of the stuff that's in the bygone eras is set apart. It's righteous. It's holy. And I'm old enough to remember when no woman ever went outside without a hat on of some sort. It might have just been a scarf, but they didn't. No man went out of the house without a hat on. It might have been a fedora if they were a businessman. It might have been just a cap if they were a, a working class gentleman. Doesn't matter. And we've lost all that for whatever reason. And we need to bring it back. We need to understand that Yahoo is our covering and we wear a hub head covering, then we partake of that. We need to return to the old ways. I will just close with this scripture that, you know, it says in Jeremiah 6, 16, Thus saith Yahuwah, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way and walk therein? And you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. I would pray that that would not be you and that you would follow the old paths and the old ways. Now, in closing, I would just mention that we are releasing this as we're coming into the holiday season and we would really appreciate your prayers and your support, especially during this time. Uh, we're under a lot of warfare, under a lot of bombardment and the needs are great both for your prayers and support we really appreciate everything that people send us, all the prayers that people pray. We are very blessed by that. But we would also ask you to please share this. And if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. And please remember us in your prayers and your giving. Shalom, shalom.